Philly Startup Leaders presents the 2013 Founder Factory Conference. This program was recorded November 21st, 2013 at the World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. Founder Factory thanks these sponsors for their continued financial support. In this video, keynote remarks by Julian Brodsky, co-founder and retired vice chairman of Comcast Corporation. I have the pleasure to introduce Julian Brodsky, uh, one of the original founders of Comcast, who'll be spending a couple minutes with us today. Um, there's a couple things I'd like to point out uh, about Mr. Brodsky. Uh, people talk about startups starting in a garage. Uh, the three original founders of, Com of Comcast started in Julian's card on Julian's card table, the original idea for Comcast, 50 years ago yesterday. So we spent most of the day talking about scale, um, and, the, and these three fine folks grew a family-run business into quite the empire. They took a path of acquisitions, uh, perhaps more than venture funding, um, and, and scale the way we talk about uh, for most of today, we've been on sort of the bootstrapped or, or, or a lot of venture-backed uh, software startups, and I think it would be really nice to have the perspective of somebody who took sort of the family-run business through acquisition, um, and, and I could not be happier and, and more thrilled that uh, Julian was willing to take time out of the celebrations for the half-century uh, anniversary. So without further ado, uh, Julian Brodsky. Well, it's great to be here among entrepreneurs, uh, obviously a soft spot in our collective hearts. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of Comcast and cable television and a little bit of how we got from there to there. Uh, you know, I, I'm retired uh, you know, as an officer and director of Comcast, so my remarks should be considered personal rather than corporate, although I doubt I'll be seeing anything, saying anything very controversial. Today, uh, globalization is all the rage. It's best epitomized by Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. Well, thank goodness that is a reality of economics rather than a law of geography. CATV, cable TV, or as it was formerly known, community antenna television, is founded on the simple physical principle that the earth is curved. TV signals as contrasted to radio waves travel in a straight line. Therefore, they're not obtainable more than 50 or 60 miles from the point of transmission, depending upon the topology of the landscape. In the 40s and 50s, there were only three broadcast networks in the United States. And toward the end of the 1940s, the FCC put a freeze on the construction of new TV stations while they tried to sort out spectrum allocation issues. Some things just don't change. Most of these TV broadcasters were in the larger towns and cities. In the more, in the more remote areas, Entrepreneurs, often TV repairmen or appliance dealers, anxious to sell TV sets in an area in which there was no TV, constructed towers, usually on hills, to capture these signals as they passed over their towns. They then ran wires down the hills and into town they got onto utility poles or sometimes just tacked the wires to the sides of houses. They charged two to three dollars a month for this service. If they were lucky, they got a hundred dollar installation fee to wire the next few houses. Comcast was started by three of us in November of 1963 with the purchase 
of a 1,200 subscriber cable system in Tupelo, Mississippi. It cost around $250,000. We borrowed most of it. Tupelo had a dozen employees and less than $100,000 of annual revenue. It was a classic community antenna system bringing the three networks from Memphis, Tennessee into this TV-starved area. Today, Comcast revenue is over $65 billion a year. We have over 130,000 employees. We serve 20 million video customers, have over 20 million high-speed data internet customers, and over 10 million telephone connections, which makes us, in addition to being the country's largest internet service provider, the fourth largest telephone wireline company in the United States. This is rather ironic, because I always thought my tombstone would say, he was born hating the telephone company, lived his entire life hating the telephone company, and died hating the telephone company. But here we are, a telephone company. Today, Comcast market capitalization is about $100 billion, which when added to our sizable debt, yields an enterprise value of almost $150 billion. We did this by being obsessed with growth. We had, had an unending series of buy and build opportunities accompanied by innovative M&A financing and operating techniques. Some of the scaling techniques we used included changes in management style. When we started, and we started with just about $100,000 of capital for the whole enterprise, it was a highly centralized management style because every dollar was precious and two of us made every single decision and the company literally became gridlocked outside the operating guy's door and my door. And we came to the conclusion there was no way we could grow in this highly centralized atmosphere. So we went to a rather strong decentralized method of operation where all the power and all the decision making went to the local and regional operating guys. And to accomplish that, we had to institute a highly disciplined budgeting and financial reporting process that allowed us to control a decentralized operation. Then as we got to the size we are today, we came to the conclusion that we could no longer take advantage of our scale by being so highly decentralized. So we've gone to a modified centralized method of operation where we can take advantage of the buying power, research, and marketing decisions that are now done on a centralized basis. With regard to capital, the greatest way to scale, of course, is to use other people's money. <laughs> and we did this not particularly through venture capital, but through lots of innovative techniques, principally by slicing and dicing the number of entities and having a whole series of control, and that's usually 50.1% was, <laughs> we tried to get as much money as we can and keep control, uh, and we just did this from one subsidiary. If we got to the bottom subsidiary, our economic interest may have been 5 or 10%, but we still controlled it. We were able to consolidate and run and operate everything up through this whole string of controlled subsidiaries. We did off-balance sheet 
projects using techniques such as master limited partnerships, leasing. And we did this as a rather small company. We started doing this in the 1970s uh, when the company was just, you know, 15 or 20 years old. Another way we were able to scale our capital was the use of tax benefit transfers. Startup companies, for the most part, can't utilize the tax losses they, that they generate. Not so much in, in the technology uh, field, but certain fields such as cable, where you have to spend a lot of capital expenditures, where we had predictable startup losses before we turned profitable, and we had no way to use these benefits. So we, in turn, took in partners are where we could sold those tax benefits for equity. And that way we were able to scale our capital. In human resources, it was interesting how you had to be sensitive to the skill sets that requires as the business changed. When we were all community antenna systems, it was an industry dominated by engineers, particularly RF engineers and, and mechanical types. Then it was dominated, I call this the golden age, by the accountants. After that, we got dominated by the marketers. And today, the most important skill sets in our industry are the product types, the computer scientists, the data scientists, and the like. Toward the end of the 1980s, we realized we had reached a crisis. We could no longer get along with the three of us trying to manage mediocrity, that we needed good people. We had to seriously increase the firepower of the company to make the next great leap forward. And we then went on a hiring spree to hire as many bright and capable people as we can get our hands on. And I think that set the stage for the late 80s and what happened in the 90s and in this century. There was another important factor, pretty much unknown, that made all this possible. And that was Comcast Class B voting shares, which have super voting rights and have always been controlled by the Roberts family. This is not some afterthought foisted upon our shareholders. This capital structure existed before we went public in 1972. Another way to put it is, no one has ever purchased a share of Comcast stock without buying into the notion that the company would be controlled by the Roberts family. This control and this essentially bulletproof situation let management take extraordinary risks, make the tough decisions that would benefit and create shareholder value over the long run without worrying about the quarterly to quarterly vagaries and other short-term pressures and certainly made us immune from whatever distractions could be caused by shareholder activists. Now, I say this to you without giving you any encouragement to try to do this in your entrepreneurial efforts. It's a tough, tough sell. Uh, you know, toward the, toward the end of my career, I was involved in Comcast in-house venture capital uh, operations. And I can't remember a single situation where we granted or even seriously entertained the thought of an entrepreneur having super voting rights uh, in, in the context of a venture capital investment. Though it has happened, you know, there's some notable examples out there, Facebook, Google, a couple others, uh, media. So uh, if you got the guts and the staying power and the the greatest business in sliced bread, you might get super voting rights. Now, did this strategy work? Did we create value? A few years ago, Money Magazine uh, published a survey of shareholder value creation for the previous 30 years. Of all the public companies in the United States that have been in public for at least 30 years at that time. 
Comcast placed fifth in that group behind such stalwarts as Walmart, Intel, Southwest Airlines, and the like. Updating that data today, since we went public in 1972, our internal rate of return to our shareholders for over 40 years has been in excess of 19%. During that same period of time, the S&P 500 returned a little less than 10%. So we've doubled uh, that rate of return. Another way to put it, if someone had purchased 1,000 shares at our IPO on June 30th, 1972, at the IPO price of $7 a share, they made a $7,000 investment that investment today would be worth very close to $7 million. You know, we were lucky you know, to get into cable as early as we did. We were also significant cellular telephone operators during the 1980s, and this taught us how to compete. We were able to beat Bell Atlantic at their own game. We had 60% market share against their 40th for our cellular customers. We pioneered home shopping through our involvement in the founding and the development of QVC. We participated in the internet revolution, both through our deployment of our broadband networks and through our extensive venture capital activities. By our acquisition of NBC Universal, we have completed our strategic circle by becoming a significant content provider. It's been an unbelievably fabulous journey, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little time now. We have a lot of time now. <laughs> Let's have some questions and see what's on your mind and see what I can tell you about how we got here and what some of the specific things we might have done. What drove your interest in cable TV? <laughs> the question was, what drove my interest in cable TV? It's a combination of factors. In 1959, I don't know what you guys were doing in 1959, uh, I was a practicing CPA, a tax specialist, and the uh, Congress had just put in the subchapter S provision into the Internal Revenue Code, which allowed individuals and regular corporations to be taxed as partnerships, in other words, to pass through uh, some of those tax losses I was talking about earlier. And I happened to be working for a firm here in town uh, that had six cable pioneers, six different companies as clients in the hills and valleys of Pennsylvania, and my job was to go out there and uh, convert them from either uh, proprietorships or normal corporations into subchapter S corporations. And you know, when you're in public accounting, you, you visit dozens of companies and see different businesses. And I can remember clearly coming back to the staff room and telling the, because none of us ever heard or knew anything about this, you know, living in a city. Uh, but this great business these guys in the, in the valleys of Pennsylvania had created, uh, building these cable systems and neat catch benefits, how easy it was to finance and all that sort of thing. So in the back of my mind, uh, uh, I had this, this, uh, this, this good feeling about cable. Many years later, as, as an M&A specialist, not many years, a couple of years later, uh, Ralph Roberts uh, was the principal shareholder and the CEO of the Pioneer Belt and Suspender Company in Darby, Pennsylvania, just outside the Philadelphia city line. And Ralph was a great strategist. And he saw an ad for a product called Sansa Belt. These are trousers that would stay up without a belt. And it terrified him and said, maybe it's not the best time to be in the belt business. <laughs> and so in the true, he was the number two belt manufacturer in the United States. In the true American fashion, he's, he sold out his belt business to the number one belt manufacturer in the United States, the Hickok Belt Manufacturing Company in Rochester, New York. And uh, 
You know, Ralph had an old line treasurer and an old line controller who were perfectly capable and wonderful in a manufacturing environment, didn't know anything about transactions. And these New York lawyers and New York accountants showed up and said, Ralph said, uh oh. So he called down to his accounting firm for some help in this area. By that time, I was an MA specialist and I was lent out. To, to help Ralph and the Pioneer Belt and Suspender Company uh, finalize the transaction. And when the transaction was done, uh, Ralph had a pile of cash, uh, a small toiletries business that didn't amount to a whole lot, and was going to spend time looking for something to do. That was not a particularly attractive uh, order to clients. Nobody was really interested in doing it. But I had spent you know, a month or so with Ralph, and to spend a little time with Ralph is to get to know and love Ralph. So I kept it as a client and I went out there every quarter and uh, had all day to do the job. It took an hour and a half and so we sit and talk and keep saying, what are you going to do? So he looked at a, a dozen businesses and finally uh, Pete Musser from Scientific Safe, Safeguard Scientific uh, was going through one of his periodic liquidity issues and had this rundown, <laughs> this rundown cable system in, in Tupelo, Mississippi, and hired Dan Aaron, who was running Gerald's cable systems, to help him broker it. And right here on Chestnut Street, they, they pitched Ralph. And Ralph had looked at cable, but couldn't figure out what to do with it if he found one. And Dan had been running cable systems. And uh, he said to, to Dan and Pete, look, I'll buy this thing if you, Dan, will come join me and we'll build uh, a big cable company together. And uh, I heard about it the uh, next couple of days and said, whoa, I love what I saw about cable. You know, I loved Ralph. I told him, he shocked him. I just resigned. You're not doing this without me. And that's how the three of us got together in, in 1963. That was the short answer. <laughs> back there, sir. Obviously, there's a lot of times to look back on and think you know, where, where there are opportunities to do things differently or you know, potentially change the course, pivot. Is there anything that really stands out in the history of the decade that it has an opportunity that something specific you would have done differently that might have ended out you know, speeding growth or getting you into different markets faster? Yeah, there, 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 well, one, you know, uh, we regret every cable system we didn't buy that we had a chance to buy. <laughs> the, the word around the comp case is that Ralph and I never saw a cable system we didn't like. So, But no, it's, if you were on Mars and you were a strategic thinker on Mars looking down on Comcast in, throughout the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, you would say these guys are obsessed with distribution, and they are not paying enough attention to content. That's why I said when I said when I discussed the NBC Universal transaction, we had completed our strategic circle by by getting all the content that goes along with NBC Universal. Uh, the classic story in that regard, and, and the key to our thinking was. Ted Turner, you know, a, a really great man, had bought the MGM Film Library, grossly overpaid for it, couldn't make the payments, but it was enormously valuable for cable, for cable TV to have access to all those great movies in the MGM Film Library. So Kirk Kerkorian was about to foreclose on Ted's notes because Ted could not make the payments for the for, the, for the, uh, the film library. So uh, a number of cable leaders uh, organized a rescue attempt for Ted Turner. This is, it was not trivial, it was, it was over a billion dollars involved to, uh, to bail. Uh, that was real money back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, to bail Ted out of the situation. And we got invited to the meeting and uh, Everybody said, you know, it was like, it was, it was like a, an Israeli bond sale. Everybody put up their hand, I commit to so-and-so, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and they asked us, and we said, you know, they wanted us to put up $75 million. Was, was, everything was based roughly on your size. And we declined uh, for two reasons. First, we didn't have $75 million. Uh, didn't have a, any chance of getting it for, for that purpose. And if we had, 
there is no question we would put it up on the poles or on the ground and just got, did more distribution. We were so fixated. I can remember today on the same subject. By the way, that 75 million would be worth billions uh, today uh, because uh, uh, Turner Broadcasting developed into a, a, an enormously successful company uh, that was. You, you ended up with Turner Broadcasting stock in, in the in the rescue attempt. Uh, and I can remember the day. The founders of the Discovery Channel came in to see us, and uh, and for a very modest amount, we could have been a significant shareholder in, in Discovery Communications, which has been enormously financially successful. We turned it down. We were just so that was the kind of thing that that uh, I guess I guess this lesson that we were just fixated with with distribution and uh, thought content was just for other people. Many other cable operators made significant. Uh, TCI, number one, uh, had through Liberty Media made lots and lots of them, including Discovery, and, uh, and that led the Turner bailout. Time Warner, obviously. Cox Communications had a big portfolio. The uh, Advanced Communications, uh, uh, they, they all, you know, so many of them did. Sir. Can you talk a little bit about Philadelphia and the reasons why you started your head first here and kept it here for so long? Yeah, Phil, well, we're, all, we're all Philadelphians. <laughs> I mean, uh, except for, well, Dan, uh, our third partner. Ralph went to Germantown High School. Uh, I went to Overbrook High School. Uh, we, we both went to Penn. Uh, there was never a thought of being any place else. Uh, Dan Aaron uh, was born in Germany. His family escaped in the late 1930s, and uh, through a series of tragedies, he grew up in foster homes, but ended up, uh, after serving in the army and during World War II, at, at Temple and Penn. And uh, so there was really never a question of us being anywhere. And it's, it's odd, until the mid 80s, that we had no business at all in Philadelphia. Our businesses were all in other cities. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just the way Dan, Ralph, and I, well, we started in Balakinwood, just across the city line. That's happened to be the building in which we were located from 1963 until 1989, when we moved into the city itself. But uh, there was never a question that we were going to move into the city. Now, when we did the, uh, you yeah, know, we, we did another landmark transaction. Uh, we bought out AT&T Broadband. It was the number one cable operator in the United States in 2002 with 14 million subscribers. Well, we only had about seven and a half million subscribers. Uh, and, you know, AT&T is a gigantic company. And one of the deal points was they wanted us to move the headquarters uh, from Philadelphia to New York of the combined company. They felt because of their size, they could dictate a lot of the terms of the transactions. Uh, you know, they weren't used to dealing with rabid dogs from Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and I've got to hand it to Brian. He held firm. It was, it was just a showstopper. It's not going to happen. We're, we're staying in Philadelphia. And that, that was further cemented uh, by our, our getting involved with the Comcast Center. And uh, there's a rumor on the street that soon there will be a, another tower uh, very close to the, uh, being built very close to the Comcast Center. So it's just, we're Philadelphians. Way back there? Yeah, so uh, a lot of VCs today and angel investors are always talking about, you know, what's defensible about your technology in the very early stages. So one of the things that you mentioned when you opened your speech was that you were able to raise $100,000. Did Comcast have anything defensible or proprietary at that time, or did you well, we had, we, had the proceeds, we had the proceeds of the belt company. We didn't raise it. We had it. It was the proceeds from the sale of the belt company. Uh, it, was, it was in the bank. Um, we used lots of uh, ways of doing it. Uh, in our business, uh, it was odd. It was, it was, some parts of it were a natural monopoly. I can say that now. I never would have said it then. <laughs> Now you could have a choice of five providers of video services in some markets, certainly a minimum of three 
most places four and uh, some places five uh, people that give you the same type of video service that uh, that Comcast delivers. Uh, so it was it was it was, it was execution. Uh, you know. Uh, as you, as we look at uh, at very go to your, your question, look at various venture capital investments. At least when we were when I was involved in the, in venture capital, you always considered what was unique about the company and what were the barriers to entry. But there were so many. There were not so many. There were other things that were even more important. Uh, Execution certainly, but the most important one I've always felt, and this was without this being there, I would even think about it. And that is the size of the potential market. Even if there's not a great barrier to entry, if you have a capable management team and the ability to execute, and the market is large enough, and the idea is good enough, even with the potential for competition, it still could be a successful business and a successful investment. Sure, it's great if the, you know if you have you know, the secret sauce that nobody could ever imitate, and, and and that makes it a lot easier. But even that, if only three people are going to buy it, uh, you know the size of the market, uh, you know, is still in my mind a determining factor for a, a decent uh, VC investment. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Oh, we got one there. Uh, yeah, before you go, do you have any sense about um, how Comcast could grow in the next 20 years, what they could do post uh, the NBC acquisition? Well, uh, a couple things. Uh, I think we've just seen scratch the surface of what the broadband technologies can do, particularly in, 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 a, in a mobile environment. And uh, you know, I think as time goes along, companies such as Comcast will be known uh, not as video companies, but really as uh, internet and uh, broadband uh, suppliers. Uh, particularly to, to mobile devices. And, and certainly the living room will, will always be an important place for entertainment. Comcast in its distribution business is 100% domestic. So as you look over the next five or 10 years, uh, I think you'll see Comcast in various forms of distribution, not wires, almost bound to be satellite and other wireless technologies uh, will have significant international operations. And, uh, and content will always be finding different ways of doing it. Uh, you know, I, I think Comcast and the cable guys are, are nimble enough to react to all these changes in technology and they will be the preferred aggregator of content and services because they're good at that, and they understand the customers, uh, and they're very good at servicing, no matter what you think. Uh, <laughs> and, and particularly adept at collecting money for suppliers. And you think, you think about how business models change. How else could somebody like ESPN figure out a way to get billions of dollars a month from 110 million households. They're going to do it themselves. They're going to have their own call centers, run trucks. You know, when, when someone calls a, a cable office today, they'll take care of their computer. They'll fix their browser. They'll do everything uh, for that customer. And so the, 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 ca the cable industry is uniquely positioned to partake in everything that's going to be coming down the road. Well, I want to thank you all very much. Have fun. This has been great. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this program from Philly Startup Leaders. For more information, visit phillystartupleaders.org.
This program is a production of Professional Podcasts, a division of the Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. If you'd like to purchase DVDs of Founder Factory programs, visit our online store, lubetkin.net forward slash cubecart. For everyone at Philly Startup Leaders, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care.